As you can all see, I'm back in London, and may I first of all take this opportunity to thank you all who have borne with me over the last few weeks whilst I was in the Peak District and put up with the sometimes poor pictures and not particularly good sound that came from travelling. Hopefully all that is now behind us and you can all see and hear me clearly. Well, coming back uh, from the Peak District, we find that the global crisis around Ukraine continues, but there's lots of other things going on at the same time. President Macron's party has, put, has had a deeply disappointing result in the, French, the first round of the French parliamentary elections. It now looks possible <clears throat> that he will lose his parliamentary majority, in which case he may be forced to cohabit with a prime minister, not if he's choosing, and could very well find himself a lame duck president for the remainder of his presidential term. We will be discussing that, Alex Christoforo and I, in a video which we will be doing on the Duran. There's also been some extremely um, unhappy, difficult talks between the military leaders of China and the United States. The US came away from those talks. This is between General uh, Austin, Lloyd Austin, the US Defense Secretary, and his Chinese opposite number. The US came away saying that the talks had gone reasonably well and that the Chinese comments on Taiwan were less strong than they have been in the past. That is incomprehensible. The Chinese have gone out of their way to reject that. And in fact, one gets the sense that far from the situation over Taiwan settling, it is actually deteriorating, making the prospect of a war there even more likely. That, too, is a subject that I'm going to discuss in a programme with Alex Christoforo. And the third, <coughs> third topic, which is, in fact, directly connected to our, topics, our topic today, which I'm afraid will again be about Ukraine, is the deteriorating economic situation. Incomprehensibly, there was some discussion in the United States um, over the last few weeks that inflation there might have peaked. There then comes in the shock May numbers which show inflation continuing to rise. And in Britain, we've now had confirmation of a GDP contraction, which also incomprehensibly seems to have come as a shock both to the political community and to the economic, uh, the economic uh, community as well. I find both surprises both the fact that inflation is increasing in the United States and indeed worldwide, and the surprise about the economic contraction in Britain, frankly baffling. And it suggests to me increasingly that the political, media and to some extent academic class are losing touch, increasingly losing touch with reality and with the general experiences of ordinary people. Well, this topic too, I will be discussing in a video with Alex Christoforo. If you want to see these videos, which we do with Alex Christoforo, you can always go to the Duran on YouTube, but I would also suggest that you join us on Locals. If you uh, go to our Locals homepage, you find links under this video. You will find all of our videos there, the videos I do, the videos Alex himself does, and the Duran videos. And you will find in time, as each of these videos is loaded, all of the videos that we have there. And we have an outstanding locals community, which um, provides you with huge opportunities for interaction. And of course, we are increasingly doing exclusive, exclusive content, publishing exclusive content on locals. I will be doing a further update shortly on the state of the Russian economy following the further interest rate cut on Friday. I'll be saying a few things about that later in this video, but I'll be doing a proper exclusive program on this um, on Locals. And of course, on Wednesday, this Wednesday, I will be resuming my Wednesday live streams on Locals, which will take place every Wednesday at 1400 hours 
Eastern Standard Time, except of course when I'm away, as I have been over the previous week. Anyway, that's housekeeping material. Let me now get on to the topic of today's video, which as I said again, is about Ukraine. And I'm afraid I'm not going to apologize for the fact that all of my recent videos, well, all the way back, stretching back to the outset of the war um, in February, have been about Ukraine. Because um, though we have a crisis of comparable and arguably even greater importance looming over Taiwan, um, which could break out perhaps this autumn, perhaps later. The main crisis at the moment, the big crisis around which all global affairs are rearranging, is the crisis which is currently underway in Ukraine. And that crisis, as I've discussed, in many programs is both a military crisis, it's a, it's a military conflict between uh, Russia and Ukraine, but with Ukraine now increasingly acting as a proxy for the NATO powers, principally of course the United States, in, in their long-standing conflict, geopolitical conflict against Russia, and of course, it is also an economic war, an economic war where um, um, the United States and its allies launched extraordinary number of sanctions against Russia in an attempt to collapse the Russian economy and to bring down President Putin. Well, what we are seeing is that neither of these wars, neither the military conflict nor the economic conflict are going as Washington expected back in February. And I'm going to start, as I traditionally do, with the information about the military conflict. Now, <clears throat> the major um, flashpoint of the fighting remains Severodonetsk, the city in northern Lugansk region, which um, um, the Russians have captured, they've captured the entire residential area of the city, except that there is a Ukrainian force, military force. It's not clear how large it is. The figures that I've seen thrown around are between 500 and 1,000, holding out in a chemical factory, the Azot chemical factory, at the outs on the, in the outskirts of Severodonetsk. And in a repeat of what happened in Mariupol, though on a much smaller scale, the Ukrainian troops in this factory area have now been entirely cut off from, Ukra from the uh, Ukrainian forces, which are um, the nearest Ukrainian forces are in the adjoining town of Lysychansk, which is across the Sever Seversky Donetsk River from uh, Severodonetsk and those tr Ukrainian troops in Lysychansk now also are being steadily um, cut off from resupply by the Rus uh, from the other remaining Ukrainian forces in northern Donbass. I've spoken many times about the lack of wisdom shown by the Ukrainian leadership in trying to cling on to these two cities, these two small cities, Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. There were there have been repeated rumours, partly confirmed by the Ukrainian governor of Lugansk region, Sergei Gaidai, that um, there was repeated uh, rumours and repeated discussion, it seems, amongst the Ukrainian leadership t uh, about the advisability of pulling Ukrainian troops out of Severodonetsk and Lysychansk and perhaps consolidating them with the larger Ukrainian grouping in the Slavyansk Kramatorsk region. This was repeatedly countermanded by the Ukrainian political leadership and the result is that we now have a Ukrainian force of several hundred men cut off in the Azot uh, chemical factory and we also have a larger Ukrainian force, perhaps 10,000 men, um, increasingly looking likely that they will soon be cut off in Lysychansk as well. And 
if we come back to the events in the azot chemical factory, it's beginning to resemble a rerun of the events in Mariupol, where, as you will no doubt remember, um, a Ukrainian force of, as it turned out, uh, um, around 1,500 men got trapped in the Azov-style steelworks. Um, they, they, for a very long time, resisted talk of surrender. And very much like the troops in Azov-style, who for a time were basically hiding behind the fact that there were large numbers of civilians also in the Azov-style steelworks, the Ukrainian forces in the Azot chemical works have also been talking up the fact that there are civilians with them in the Azot chemical works. And there are reports <coughs> that the uh, commanders, whoever they are, of the Ukrainian forces at the Azot steel, uh, chemical works, just like the commanders of the Ukrainian forces at the Azov-style steelworks in Mariupol, that the commanders in both cases have said that they want to be allowed to withdraw to Ukrainian lines, taking their civilians with them. And as happened in Mariupol with the siege of the Azov-style steelworks, so in Severodonetsk with the siege of the Azot chemical works, the Russians have said no. The Russians have said that the civilians may leave and go wherever they choose, but the only option for the soldiers, for the Ukrainian soldiers in the Azot chemical works, as it was for the soldiers in the Ukrainian soldiers in the Azov style steelworks, is for them to lay down their arms and surrender or to fight on until they die. And I should say that these troops in the Azot chemical works are now, it seems, completely cut off. Over the last couple of days, the Russians blew up the last bridge connecting Severodonetsk to Lizichansk across the uh, Seversky Donetsk River, so that the possibility of retreat or reinforcement for these troops in the Azot chemical works has now gone and they now face an impossible situation. Now, I want to make one point clear. I don't think that this is going to be as long drawn out an affair as the affair in the Azov style steelworks was. Briefly, it seems that the troops in the uh, uh, Azot chemical factory are, are basically um, regular Ukrainian troops leavened with uh, foreign volunteers or mercenaries, if you prefer, who uh, were sent into Severodonetsk by the um, Ukrainian authorities in that failed counterattack that was um, talked about, so much talked about um, two weeks ago. So I don't think that these troops have anything like the levels of motivation that the men of the Azov regiment had who were um, holding out in the Azov style steelworks. Also, as I've discussed in earlier programs, it seems that the overall commander of the Azov regiment, the military commander of the Azov regiment, was um, based in the Azov-style Azov steelworks. There doesn't seem to be anybody of similar political importance and authority in the Azov chemical works. So I expect that sooner or later, probably at some point over the next few days, both the civilians, the civilians will be allowed to leave the Azov chemical works and the Ukrainian troops there will mostly surrender. In fact, there are reports that some civilians have already been allowed to leave. So I suspect that this will not be as long drawn out an affair as the affair in Azovstal in Mariupol was. And um, in addition, it seems that the Russians have been tightening their noose 
around um, Lysychansk. The main road to Lysychansk, Lys linking Lysychansk with the um, main Ukrainian base in the rear at Bakhmut, has been under Russian, has been shelled by the Russian artillery for some time, making it all, all but impossible for the Ukrainians to send supplies there uh, uh, via that route. There is another smaller, more difficult road, which the Ukrainians are now using to try to keep their troops in Lysychansk resupplied. But there are rumours that the Russians are now closing in on that route as well. And it does seem also that the Russians are gradually, steadily closing in on Bakhmut, this main base in the rear area as well, and that this is causing the Ukrainians a multiplicity, a growing multiplicity of problems. And the British Ministry of Defence, by the way, has now published uh, uh, one of its regular updates on the war. I rarely pay much attention to those, just as, by the way, and in parenthesis, I largely ignore reports uh, published by the ne neocon-dominated Institute of War in Washington that we hear so much about. That is largely run, so far as I can see, by the Kagan family. Uh, um, um, the, its chair, the chair of the Institute of War, is apparently the wife of the brother of Robert Kagan, who is in turn married to Victoria Newland, who is the Assistant Secretary of State, who is one of Ukraine's major advocates. And this is a whole, as I said, neocon run outfit. Well, I don't usually pay much attention. I, well, I pay no attention to the Institute of War. I don't pay much attention to what the British Ministry of Defence says about the war. Um, but it did say today that from this point on, um, the future of operations in Donbass will largely depend on the success, it didn't say the success of whom, but clearly it means the Russians, in crossing, in carrying out crossings of the Seversky Donetsk River. And these crossings are now, by the way, going to become much easier because with the hot weather, with the summer now closing in, the water levels of the Seversky Donetsk River are falling, making uh, crossings much easier. There are apparently even places where one can actually wade across. So it's likely that over the next couple of weeks, we're going to start to see an increase in tempo of Russian armoured offensives in Ukraine. And it seems that the Ukrainians are basically now desperately short of armour. They lack, it seems, tanks and armoured vehicles, and that their artillery, as discussed in previous programmes, um, whilst it's not been entirely silenced, it, the the Soviet era artillery, which was its main artillery force, is now all but out of ammunition. And the Western artillery that's been supplied, around 150 guns in total, some of it has already been destroyed and it is proving to be massively outmatched by what the Russians can deploy in this theatre anyway. So I'm going to make a guess, and it's purely a guess, I repeat again, I'm not much of a military person, but I suspect that the Russians will roll up Severodonetsk within the next couple of days. Lysychansk and Bakhmut will take a little longer. At that point, all of Lugansk region will have fallen under Russian control. And thereafter, the Russians will then no doubt close in on the main Ukrainian grouping in Slavyansk and Kramatorsk, the, the government of the breakaway Donetsk People's Republic, which is of course allied to Russia and which is, whose forces are also contributing to this conflict. The government of the Donetsk People's Republic say that there are as many as 70,000 Ukrainian troops now in, Slavyansk, in the Slavyansk Kramatorsk conurbation. Troops who are, by the way, at serious risk of encirclement as well. If that is true, then obviously there will be a major battle for these two towns. But if this grouping is defeated, 
and destroyed, then the heart of the Ukrainian army will have been destroyed as well. Always assuming, of course, that these claims that there are as many as 70,000 Ukrainian troops concentrated there are, are true. But anyway, that seems to me what's going to happen. I think we're going to see all of these towns fall. We're going to see Russian armour operating with uh, greater speed over harder ground, with Ukrainians unable to deploy armoured forces in response, and, um, I, and with the Russians continuing to overwhelm the Ukrainians in, term of art, in terms of artillery. So it's going to be a hot summer in Ukraine. I suspect it's the summer that's going to decide the outcome of the war. Again, I stress, I'm not a military person. Now, alongside all of this, we've been getting more and more economic news. And I want to say, stress again that it's sometimes been suggested that, the, and that there was no, no actual coherent Western strategy over this, uh, over how to handle this war. But I think that this is wrong. I think that at the beginning, back in February, there was a widespread assumption in Washington and in London and in Brussels that the Russians would overextend themselves militarily in Ukraine, that Ukraine would prove a difficult nut for the Russians to crack, that the Russians would get bogged down fighting in Ukraine, and that this massive sanctions that were fired at them, that that would create an economic and political crisis in Russia, so that with Russia bogged down and making no progress in Ukraine, and with the Russian economy in the process of collapse, President Putin's government would become discredited and would fall, and that the, the Russians would suffer some kind of spectacular defeat in Ukraine. Well, the Russians, through, I think, and I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I think the Russians, through rather deft military um, operations, have successfully um, avoided getting bogged down. But of course, the major difference is that the economics, the economic war, has worked out profoundly differently from the way it's been it was expected now on friday the um russian central bank reduced interest rates they've now gone down to 9.5 percent there's now confirmation from the russian central bank that um prices for uh, food and energy products are actually falling and the central bank has actually reduced its um, its uh, forecasts for inflation in Russia this year. Inflation in Russia is now um, declining, um, and it could, at some point soon, very soon, converge with inflation rates in the West. Um, perhaps even more surprising is that there are now there are now incre there is now increasing evidence of a rebound in economic and in particular in industrial activity. Now, we've had some announcements about this which point to that, like the fact that the um, Aftovaz factory in the town of Togliati, the town that makes larder cars, the, the factory that makes larder cars, that that has now resumed production. There's been much derision of the fact that the larder granta, which has been built by this factory, is an all-Russian product, and apparently it's a rather austere car, um, and rather cheap, and easily, you know, and, and of course it doesn't supposedly live up to the high expectations we have in the West of what a car should be well maybe that's true maybe it's not my uh, what i've heard about it is that it's actually a pretty tough and reliable car well suited to russian conditions but of course it is a budget car for um you know a, a family um 
or, so, or, or on limited means. So, you know, we're talking about a, a mass volume budget car. But the point is that it's back in production. So we've seen that this factory, which was expected to remain closed for months, there was the universal expect, expectation that Russian car production would grind to a total stop. Well, that doesn't seem to be happening. But that's one factory. The thing is, the more important fact is that the central bank is itself now confirming that there has been a general pickup of economic activity in Russia right across the board. And I'm going to discuss, as I said, in a video which I'm going to make soon and which will appear exclusively on Locals, the really most extraordinary comments of the governor of Russia's central bank, Elvira Nabulina, when she announced the interest rate cut on Friday. Because you could almost get the sense of Nabulina astonished by her own success. She was saying that, you know, inflation is falling much faster than we'd ever imagined. And, you know, it's, fa it's falling so much faster that, you know, we are not able quite to believe that this fall in inflation is taking place and that economic activity is reviving. And again, this is, ha this is a surprise for us. We, we're almost pinching ourselves because we can't quite believe that this is really true. Now, there's been much said about Nabolina. There's been many criticisms of her, uh, some very telling criticisms by Sergei Glaziev, who is a, uh, a Russian economist, who is an economic advisor of President Putin's, and indeed also by the American economist, Michael Hudson. And I should say, I've criticised Nabolina myself in the past. I've always felt that her monetary policies, until very recently, were far too tough. But I think that she has actually excelled, and I must say this, over the course of this crisis. I think her response to the sanctions against the Russian uh, central bank were extraordinarily well conceived, and they have proved more successful than she could possibly, obviously, she dared herself imagine. And this is true of other parts of the Russian government, the economics ministry, the industry ministry, the finance ministry, they've all responded to the challenge of the sanctions far more competently than anybody in the West supposed. But one gets the sense that even they, all of them, taken together, the entire government, President Putin himself perhaps, didn't expect that the turnaround in the Russian economy would be quite as successful as it has turned out to be. Now, when people find themselves in a situation where things are turning out even better than they expected, or far better than they expected, often that makes them extremely nervous. <laughs> we all know that feeling, and they're asking themselves, well, what can go wrong? I mean, this is almost too good to be true. Is there something we're missing here? Is there something that could just suddenly fall apart suddenly? And of course, one has to always say that in these kind of fast moving and complex situations, there is always the possibility that something could go seriously wrong. But the fact remains that at the moment, things are actually looking up in Russia. The reaction to the central bank's reduction in interest rates from 11% to 9.5% was that the ruble strengthened. Um, the central bank has been trying to weaken the ruble because, in my opinion, they have a misconceived belief. I think it's misconceived at the moment. Longer term, it may turn out to be correct. But I think that they're worried that an overstrong ruble will create problems for the economy going forward. I think at the present time, Russia needs, a strong, need, needs the ruble stronger rather than weaker. But anyway, at the moment, the ruble is trading at 57 to the dollar. It was um, in the mid-70s before the crisis in Ukraine began. It briefly fell to around 150 to the dollar in the first weeks 
after the sanctions were announced, but it's been steadily strengthening ever since, even as interest rates have been falling. And one has to say that the fact that the ruble has been strengthening in this way, though it is undoubtedly playing a role in the good economic numbers which we are seeing. It is also reflective of a growth in confidence amongst the Russian people about the state of the economy, and that is reflected in the state of their currency. So that's where we are in Russia at the moment. Contrast that with the situation in the West. We see that in the United States, inflation has risen. As I say, it's a subject Alex Christoforo and I will be discussing in another program. We see that in Britain, GDP has contracted. Ditto. Uh, we will be discussing that in another program. And we can see growing dismay because the Russian recovery, the, the, the fact that Russia didn't buckle under the sanctions has given the Russians the time they need to get on top of all the military problems that they faced in Ukraine itself. And that was not what was anticipated in the West back in February. So instead of the Russians being bogged down militarily in the West, uh, in Ukraine, and as their economy collapses, we see the Russian economy strengthening and stabilizing, giving the Russians all the time they need to get on top of the military problems in Ukraine itself. Meanwhile, in the West, and this again I think was completely unexpected, it is the Western economies that find themselves in a state of deterioration. And there is now clearly recrimination going on behind the scenes and a debate going on. And the clearest sign I've seen so far that there is such a debate is an article which appeared in the London Times by the former head of the British Army, Lord Richards. Now, the fact that this person has come out and spoken out in the way that he has now done is a sign that there is a debate, that he's speaking for some people within the British military, and that he's now criticising, feels able to criticise the politicians. And it's a sign that there, are, there is a debate underway and that this person, on behalf of at least a section of the British military, is now weighing in on that debate and doing so in a public forum. And what Lord Richard said is that the Western powers have no strategy. They do not know what to do in this crisis. And he reminded everybody that he'd been sceptical about the Iraq war, that he'd advocated that uh, the West should not involve itself in the Syrian conflict and that it would, the better outcome for the West was to allow President Assad to win the war in Syria and that he was adamantly opposed to the intervention in Libya. In other words, he's pointing out that he has a much better record and one suspects the military has a much better record than the politicians have about these sorts of conflicts. And he complains that Western leaders lack any conception of grand strategy. And what he's saying is that the result of Western policy is that China and Russia are drawing closer together when the whole policy, the whole purpose of policy, given the crisis the West potentially faces from this converging alliance of the two, was to prize them apart in some way. So if the Ukraine war was intended to create a crisis in Russia, which would pull Russia away from China, it's having the opposite effect. And Lord Richards is saying, we've got to stop. We've got to think what we're doing, because this is turning out badly for us in the long term. Now, Lord Richards doesn't provide a way out. He doesn't say what the West needs to do in this situation. He's too wise, I think, to 
endanger his entire position um, by saying what he, th you know, that the West should lift the sanctions war and seek a peace settlement in Ukraine. But clearly, that's the implication of his words. Now, what would the peace settlement be? Well, I think others have been saying it too. Henry Kissinger hinted as much at this two week, uh, a few weeks ago at the Davos summit. He said that the West has only a two-month window um, to try to come up with some kind of settlement of the crisis in Ukraine. In the event that it doesn't, then the window will close. He didn't say, Kissinger didn't say that the Russians would win, but of course that's what everybody, I suspect, quietly realises he means, and then they will dictate terms. And I think that Lord Richards is probably thinking along the same lines. Now, is anybody able to listen to that in London? Well, Boris Johnson's government is now in crisis. Boris Johnson is finding his position increasingly difficult as many of his MPs voted against him in a no-confidence vote. Perhaps what Lord Richards and others behind the scenes in London are trying to do is that they're trying to manoeuvre in order to get good advice to whoever succeeds him, succeeds Johnson as Prime Minister. Perhaps if it's Jeremy Hunt, as some people hope, others fear, Jeremy Hunt is an arch Remainer, by the way, then maybe Hunt is the kind of person who might listen to that kind of advice. Well, we shall see. Anyway, there's clearly a debate going on now in Britain, which there has not been up to now. Lord Richard's article, which, by the way, was in the Daily Telegraph, not the London Times, as I inter incorrectly said, is a clear sign of this. And, of course, we are hearing that there's also arguments within the US government between the US Treasury, on the one hand, and the Pentagon, who also, it seems, are becoming increasingly unhappy about this war, this conflict with Russia in Ukraine and the sanctions war, and the State Department and the National Security Council who want to double down on it. We will see how this all plays out over the next few weeks. But obviously, at the moment, there's no clear shift in Western policy. As Lord Richards said, they're making it up as they go along. They don't really seem to know what to do. Well, that's me for the day. You'll be uh, hearing more from me over the next couple of days. Uh, remember, you can find us on Rumble and Locals. Um, as I said at the start of this program, uh, our, we have a thriving community on Locals. If you're watching this video on Rumble, if you go to the top of the video, you will see a red maroon button, and that will take you, by the way, directly to our Locals homepage. We're also available on Odyssey, and the new free speech platform SuperU and other platforms. We have a great Telegram channel where you can also see our videos. You can, you can also support us if you wish via Patreon and Subscribestar. And of course, don't forget to come to our shop and buy the great things that you will find there. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to press the like button and don't forget to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. More from me soon and have a very good day until then.